Um, just before we get started, just a reminder to everyone, uh, there's been a total fire ban declared. Warm weather plus really windy uh, conditions equals fire ban, so no naked flames outside. If you're a smoker, be careful. No burning of effigies or anything like that. Um, our first talk uh, this afternoon is uh, from uh, Laura and Cheyenne. That's correct. Um, from Mozilla. Um, the topic is uh, moving day, migrating big data from A to B. Thanks. Hi. Um, my name's Laura. I work at Mozilla with Sham. Uh, and I look after the web tools team, which is the team that builds all of the web apps that are used by Firefox engineers rather than by the general public. Um, and Sham is on the IT systems team which means that he gets to make things work. Yeah. Hello. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's about the introduction. I think yeah. we're good. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. Um, and today we're going to talk to you about a project that we did last year, um, which involved a fairly major and unpleasant data center migration. It consumed our days and nights for a number of months. Um, and hopefully you can learn something, if it's only what not to do. First of all, um, this is what we're going to talk about. I'll tell you about the system that we moved, um, why we needed to move, how we planned it, uh, what the problems were, and what went wrong, and the actual day. And finally, that's kind of the, the aftermath and postmortems and such. Um, first of all, the project that we had to move is a thing called Socorro. I talked about it briefly in the browser miniconf yesterday, so these first couple of slides are similar because they're the, this is what it is, this is what it does. Um, Socorro is a very large telescope array in New Mexico in the United States. Um, it's also Spanish for help. It's also a very good brewery. Um, but in this case, it is the crash reporting system for Firefox. You can have a look at uh, the data that we have. It's crash-stats.mozilla.com if you're sitting in front of a web browser. Okay. So you've probably all seen this. This is um, hopefully the dialogue that you get when Firefox crashes. Um, when you actually hit submit my crash to Mozilla and restart Firefox, you might wonder where that data goes and the answer is that it comes to us. Um, if you're looking at the website, if you're not, this is the Mozilla Crash Reports website. It tells you all kinds of interesting stuff like what are the most common crashes, how crashy the different versions of Firefox are. And it's actually, there's a whole team of people that look at this and it's used to prioritise work. Um, so don't think that we're not listening because there's a lot of people that look at this stuff every day. Um, probably the most commonly used thing is this thing called the top crashes. Um, we look at, uh, for a particular product version and channel, um, what the most common crashes are, what operating systems they occur on, uh, how often they occur, and you'll see, I don't know if you can see that from there, but um, which ones have a bug associated with them, and crashes that occur that are common that don't have a bug associated with them, they need to get bugs on file and so on. Okay, so the typical use cases of the system, uh, what are the most common crashes, so we know where to target our efforts. Um, what are new crashes and regressions that we see, like emergent crashes? Examples of that might be in a release version of Firefox. Uh, Zynga releases a new version of Farmville. There's some JavaScript around that that pokes a code path that wasn't getting po poked before and now we have a crash. Um, we also have things like, is this build ready to release or is it too crashy? Like, is it 10 times crashier than the previous build? Ideally, it would be more stable. Um, and what kind of correlations do we see? So with this particular crash, is it correlated with particular add-ons? Um, is it correlated with flash and so on? Is it correlated with malware? Um, there's all kind of ad hoc reporting and other kind of more interesting things we can answer. Um, I'll talk about some of these, which are probably not interesting to everyone here. Um, you know, do certain versions of Flash cause more crashes, crashes than others? Um, there's a little bit of duplicate data in the system. In any telemetry system, you're essentially getting a lot of noise. Um, and there's some jitter in it, so some things will be reported twice. We look for explosive crashes, which are things that were sort of very low in frequency one day, and the next day, they're sort of off the charts. Um, we can find Franken installs, something we did once, where the Firefox updater wasn't working well. So you would have um, some DLLs from, say, Firefox 4 and some other DLLs from Firefox 7 if you're on Windows. Notice most of my examples are from Windows. That's because most of the crashes are from Windows. Um, probably not very, most of our users are on Windows, so let's be honest. 
Um, we can, if people give us their email addresses, we can email them and say, what were you doing when you crashed? Is one thing, like what were the steps to reproduce this? That's particularly useful for what we call chem spill crashes, which are things where we are going to have to spin a release to solve that. So the Mozilla version of a fire drill. Um, uh, and the other thing we've used it to email them is to say, the reason that you have this crash is because you have this piece of malware, and if you run an antivirus, your problem will stop. So those are the kind of things that we do with it. It's a really complicated system. Um, this, this is kind of the first diagram that we do when it's like, well, we don't actually have an architecture diagram, so let's sit down and draw one. So there's a lot of pieces. Give me a slide. Um, and I happen to sort of say to one of the senior guys on it, you know, there's a, a lot of moving parts in Socorro space. Um, and he's, I said, a lot of moving parts. He said, I prefer to think of them as dancing parts. So I have kind of a, a more simplified architecture diagram. And I'm going to talk through this um, just so that when I'm talking about the data migration and so on, you know, you understand what pieces I'm talking about. When crashes arrive, top left-hand corner via the collector, um, the Firefox client submits them via an HTTP post. Uh, the crash itself consists of two files. There is a mini dump file, which is like a core dump, only much smaller. Um, hence the name mini dump. The median size of those is around 150k. So it's a post, but it's a post of a blob of binary data. And the second thing that comes with it is a little bit of JSON with metadata involved in it. Those crashes, um, they now get written to disk. At the time of this migration, we were writing them straight into our major data store, which is HBase. HBase is the Hadoop database. It's a NoSQL data store. If you know anything about CAP theorem, um, put up your hand if you don't know what CAP theorem is. Okay. Um, with a data store, there are three basic properties that you can have. They are consistency, including eventual consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Pick any two. Okay, so HBase is really good at eventual consistency and partition tolerance. You can have it, your data spread over a lot of nodes. Um, availability is not its strength, and in retrospect, maybe not the right thing to choose to build this system. But that's kind of another debate, debate for another day. We write the unprocessed crashes into HBase. There is a monitoring process that looks at these crashes, notices a crash has arrived, and assigns it to a processor for processing. The processor picks up a crash, takes this raw dump and the metadata, and tries to turn it into a stack trace. And it does that by connecting to a symbol store, um, parsing all the symbols, and basically turning it back into something you can use. The other thing the processor does is it tries to fingerprint a crash. It generates what is called a crash signature. A crash signature is, generally speaking, the name of the function that Firefox was in when it crashed. But there is kind of a, a system of regexes, because sometimes the function you're in then you crashed isn't very interesting. You know, if you crash in JE malloc, we don't really care. We want to know what the caller was. Um, OK, so the processor processes the crash and writes the processed crash back to HBase and writes metadata to a very large Postgres instance. Um, we are effectively using Postgres in this system as a web app cache, um, which might seem kind of funny. But if you consider that a lot of things that we have to generate are very large and expensive to calculate, um, it makes more sense to store them in something um, with persistence rather than storing them in memcache. Having said that, we do also use memcache. Um, in front of Postgres and HBase, there is a middleware layer. It's a Restian API. And in front of that, there is a web app. Most of the code in this is written in Python 2.6. The web app is Kohana PHP. Um, likely to rewrite that this year, um, probably using Django. So any questions? It's very hard to see you guys. No. OK. So um, our DBA refers to what we do as firehose engineering because somebody has this giant fire hose of data and they're pointing at us and we're trying to sort of catch it and put it in buckets and do something useful with it. Um, at peak, we get 2,300 crashes per minute. That's come down a little bit. It was about 3,000 per minute at one point. Um, so it's a good thing. It's about 2.5 million per day. We get crashes for Firefox, Thunderbird, mobile Firefox, and the new version of mobile Firefox, which is written partially in Java, um, generating stack traces for C++ and Java. Interesting. Um, the crashes that are coming from Android are a little bit bigger, but in general, they're about 150k a piece. At the moment, we have about six months worth of data stored. It's around 110 terabytes total, but it's only really 40 terabytes of data. It's triple replicated. HBase is built on HDFS, which is the Hadoop distributed file system, which uses triple replication for uh, redundancy. OK. So that's the system. Now we have the problem. We had seen a lot of um, 
outages and instabilities and basically just sort of general fragility from HBase. And the reason that we saw that was, but we're starting to approach capacity where we had used about 85% of our disk storage. And it seems from experience using this now that somewhere between 80 and 85% is where it starts to get a little flaky. And you'll know yourself with any kind of disk or memory or anything, there's kind of like a, a reasonable, there's capacity and then there's like a reasonable usage at which things start to break down. And we had approached that point. So we thought we will just add more boxes. And then it turned out that the data center that we were hosted in, which is in San Jose, um, was approaching capacity itself, and there was no more power in the data center. So we actually couldn't put more boxes in there. There are a few other things about it, which is that um, it's a pretty old, crafty data center. We had a lot of crafty old boxes, because the system began as something someone thought would be cool and grew really organically to be something that was on the critical path to ship Firefox. So we really wanted to kind of try and do things right if we were going to build, do it over. Um, but the question is, given that we were going to have to move out of the San Jose data center to a new data center that we had started setting up in Phoenix, Arizona, a couple of states away, um, how do you move at that point, you know, sort of 40 terabytes of real data in multiple data stores to a new infrastructure in another state with zero downtime and zero data loss? Okay. Um, to add to this, we were sort of not in a really good state. As I said, the system had grown organically and only quite not a long time prior to this had we realized that the system was really important. It sounds really stupid. Um, a lot of things at Mozilla grow very organically. And this system, which somebody said, let's build this, this will be awesome, had some, become something that was really critical. Um, releasing software, like new versions of it, were an absolute nightmare because we had lots of different boxes. Some pieces of the infrastructure were running on the same boxes as some other pieces. Nothing was well documented. Um, you had to go around and sort of manually upgrade everything by doing like an SVN up. Um, manually edit some config files and manually do QA and kind of assume that everything looked all right until somebody, you know, you got a phone call from the VP of engineering saying, oh my God, everything is broken and we can't ship. So um, that was pretty bad. We, at this stage, really didn't have a DevOps culture, and this has been like a huge change within Mozilla, um, I would say, over the last 12 to 18 months. At this stage, if we had a problem in production, um, it would go like this, you know, I would sit in my office and press my fingers together in a zen-like state and say, tell me, oh lone sysadmin that works on this project, since I can't log into any of these boxes, what does it say if you tail the logs on this machine? And can you tell me the value stored on line 55 of the config file on that machine? Um, what's in the syslog? And then you would sort of try and put these facts together without being able to look at any of it yourself. It was sort of this weird third-hand sort of Ouija board style troubleshooting. Um, I don't recommend that to anyone. It's awful. We had very little instrumentation too. So knowing that we were going to do like a clean build out and a new data center, we wanted to do it right. We had this sort of idea of like, ah, you know, this perfect infrastructure where everything would work smoothly and we would all sleep all night, every night instead of being woken up at three o'clock in the morning again. So, uh, another issue that we talked about, there was this requirement that we would have no data loss and no downtime. And that's a little bit terrifying. Um, but we sort of worked with the stakeholders and discovered that this is kind of a really important thing that I learned, that uptime for the whole system, when people say I want, you know, five nines or whatever it is, they don't necessarily mean the whole thing. And each of the components of the system really has different uptime requirements. And having talked to the users, it turned out that really, at the end of the day, what they really wanted was not to lose any data. They wanted all the data that came in to be collected, but processing could be delayed, and they were okay with the web app being offline as long as it was like on a weekend when they weren't trying to ship a new version. So we said, okay, data collection has to be up all the time. We can't lose any data. Everything else is a little bit subject to negotiation. And that way the, pro the problem becomes tractable. So we rewrote our storage system, so put in this sort of pluggable storage um, idea, so that when crashes came in, we would actually start writing them to disk, um, and then we would move them into HBase later. The funny thing is about this, which was done as a temporary stopgap, uh, it's actually still how we do things, because it worked really nicely as a buffer, right? We don't have a queue. I could talk about that all day, but I won't. Um, so we have this nice pluggable storage engine. We have um, local storage, uh, HBase, and we actually have an NFS plugin as well. Yep. Okay. So migrating the data in Postgres theoretically should be easy compared to HBase. We only had about 300 gigabytes, so it didn't seem like a really big deal. 
Um, having said that, we decided the best way to do it was to sync from San Jose to Phoenix, uh, not using replication because at this point we were not on a version of Postgres that supported replication. We had no replication. We weren't using Sloney or anything like this. It's pre-9. Um, and then 9 came out. Um, and it seemed that in our old data centre we were not in a position to support 9. So we were going to have 9 on our new infrastructure and 8 on our old infrastructure, which made it kind of interesting. So we did a sync. Um, and what we did was we did a, a number of these in maintenance windows before the big day. So on the day we had like a minimal amount of data to copy over. Um, we did on the day before, for example. But to give you an example, I'll talk more later about the importance of rehearsals. But we rehearsed this probably 25 times. Okay, so you should get to the point where when, on the day when you have to do something in a critically short time window, everything you're doing should be easy and natural and you know what you're doing. So, Moving HBase was harder. <clears throat> we had this grand plan. There's a um, copy utility in HBase called distcp. Um, and the idea of that is you shut down your HBase instance and you copy all the data across and then you restart your HBase instance and restart your other one on the other end. Um, there were some problems with this. As a starting point, it takes about 30 to 40 minutes to restart an HBase cluster. It takes a long time. Um, secondly, we, we thought we would do a trial run um, with some test clusters that we had. And when that had been running for a couple of days, we decided that this was not going to be practical. The problem is that this CP can't be run on a running instance. The that version, they're bringing it in. Um, so we had to come up with something else. Um, what we actually came up with was in-house we wrote a dirty copy tool that tries to copy the data while it's being modified, does the best job it can, then you shut everything down and run disk CP, which will make it consistent. So you do the last little bit with the slow, clean tool and most of it with the quick and dirty tool. That worked really well. So. <clears throat> In terms of kind of overall planning, um, Mozilla uses Bugzilla for everything. Bugzilla is, you know, it has its weaknesses, but it is the collective memory and knowledge of the Mozilla project is stored in our bug tracker. Um, there's all kinds of stuff in there. Um, just if you are not associated with Mozilla, let me tell you that if you want to um, hire a new employee, you file a bug. If you want legal to look at a contract, you file a bug. If you want to resign, you can actually do it by filing a bug. So, um, <clears throat> Bugzilla is really key to us. Sorry? Won't fix. <laughs> Works for me. Um, okay, so one of the things that we made a lot of use of was checklists. It was actually really hard to sell checklists to some people because they said, you know, it's just like a to-do list. I don't see where, you know, the exciting part of a checklist is and I don't see how it will save us. Um, an interesting conversation with someone that we both know really well and he was saying these things and I said, well, you know, if it's good enough for NASA and it's good enough for brain surgeon, then it's probably good enough for us. Um, a really good book, if you want a reference on this, is um, Atul Gawan's The Checklist Manifesto. He's a surgeon, he write books, writes books about performance. Um, and it's a great book, it's really short. These other books are good too. Uh, okay, the other thing we thought about was a rollback plan. We instituted a policy a while back of having a written rollback plan with all the steps that you need to do to roll back when things go wrong. And also sort of having knowledge about what are the points at which we can roll back and when have we gone too far. Uh, and finally, rehearsals. We had, and failure scenarios, we had a lot of discussion meetings, very ungeeky thing to do, where we would sit and say, okay, today we're going to talk about what we will do if this particular thing fails. What are the steps to recover from that? What are the other things that might go wrong? What if we had this cascade? And we just kind of like had a plan, most of them written, some of them at our back of our heads for what we would do if things failed. And we rehearsed. We talked through the steps. Everybody knew what they had to do when. So, yep, and now it's your turn to talk. So I'll be quiet. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, as Laura has just given you an overview, the old system that we had for Socorro was, well, a jumbled mess of a bunch of hardware put together, to say so lightly. So it was pretty uh, legacy hardware. Uh, we used to do things like, well, the sysadmin that managed it used to do stuff like checking out uh, code on the machine, compiling it on the machine. So every deployment would be, you'd log into one machine, do that, then log into another machine, repeat the process, and so on. Every server was different, so you had processors that would process crashes, but no two processors were the same configuration. 
And you'd have processors doing crash collecting as well, and then some processors would serve out the web, the web pages. So everything was completely different. There was no configuration management whatsoever. And then we also had an instance where it was sharing that server with a completely different website, which we found out later. So that was not good either. <laughs> As you can see, starting up with NoHop is not an option. <laughs> there were some demons running on screen sessions as well. <laughs> so yeah, you know how that works out. Oh, I can't find that process. Well, it's running on somebody else's screen session. <laughs> And uh, we did have some Nagios alerts, but not to the level of what we have today. I'll explain that a little bit later. And of course, uh, you never put just one person on anything, because if he's, God forbid, run over by a bus, then you're in a bit of trouble. And yeah, we didn't have any sort of automated testing, or even before the code went onto the servers. So what we decided to do right from the start on the new thing was we were, all, we were moving to Puppet. Uh, we had a bit of BCFG, but then we didn't really like it. But then we were moving a lot of our infrastructure to Puppet. So the new rule for Sakura was if it's not in Puppet, it's not going to production. So everything right from scratch was put into Puppet. Uh, no more local patches. So if you have a problem, you go through a whole build process. You commit code. Jenkins actually builds this for you gives us a tarball. So basically, the, the, I think it's in the next one. I'll get to that. So yeah, no local patches. Uh, we wrote up init scripts for stuff that we needed. We use RHEL in most environments. It's not too hard to write up an init script, so we did that. Uh, we wrote up a few Nagios plugins as well. Uh, for example, to, uh, our Nagios plugins now actually submit crashes. So we know if all our, the entire system is working. We submit false crashes. And if, it does not, if that does not go through, then we are alerted, and on-call knows that something's not right. Uh, the, we moved the entire application configuration to slash EDC and put it there. Earlier, it was just living in the home directories of wherever the application was running from. And then we decided that we will, not to the same scale, but to the same ratio, match, uh, have a matching staging environment. So they'll use the same Puppet scripts to update stuff. So we would catch issues before they went to production. And that's actually really helped in stuff. Uh, so what we decided to do then was we said, we'll help you guys out. But as a developer, we'd like you to give us something we can deploy that you're happy with. So we d the, the Sakura team decided to build tarballs and said, OK, we'll have Jenkins build tarballs, check Summit. You can deploy the tarball to stage, and then if that works out fine, QA approves it, you can take that to production. So that's what we did. Everything gets packaged, uh, pulled in, packaged into a tarball. IT really doesn't bother about what goes into it. We have a set of system packages that we install, anything else they need. Like some of the processor code mm -hmm. is compiled so, yep. and stuff. All that is built in here. And then, yeah, Jenkins runs. It's got its own tests that it runs on the stuff. And of course, no package, everything is tested. So by repeating this, we make sure that uh, we don't run into weird issues. And before we went live, uh, we set up everything in Phoenix. And we were like, well, we have all these sh shiny new machines, and we've not really tested them. So how do we go about doing it? And luckily, just then, we'd gotten a new C micro cluster, which, if you've not heard about it, is a 10U box with 512 Atom nodes in it that you can actually use as 512 individual machines if you want, or club them together. So we pulled out about 40 nodes of those and said, all right, just hammer this thing as much as you can. We spoke to Laura's team, and we said, what is, the, what is your worst day? How many crashes do you get? And I think we did about 1.5 times that. Yeah, we did yeah. quite a bit more, and it yeah. didn't break a sweat. Yeah, and we noticed that. And we had all the monitoring up on the new machines, like Ganglia, Nagios, everything was up. And it didn't break a sweat. So we were pretty confident that when it actually, when it came to crunch time, the system wouldn't have any issues. And then, uh, of course, uh, put everything in place. Uh, and obviously, uh, even after all this planning, you run into minor issues. So the first time when we actually started transferring data, the network was not performing. It was actually worse than what it was in San Jose. 
And we were all like, well, that's not supposed to happen. This is all better hardware, better equipment. And apparently, we uh, finally looked at it and found a bonding issue that we had to fix. And the network, it was on the network side, so our NetOps team took care of that. And then things sort of started making sense again. And I think I'll continue with this, too. Uh, sure. On the actual day, uh, we, the team came in to Mountain View. Uh, we have a little checklist that a uh, lot of put up. Uh, yeah, I might just talk briefly about that. We actually, so we had two checklists. One was stuff to do before the day, and there was stuff to do on the day. The URL that's in the slides, it's public. Please feel free to take a look. Um, one of the things with the before the day checklist was that we had sort of a number of go, no go points. One thing I find really important is to kind of give up control over your releases to QA. Um, and we decided we wouldn't go ahead unless everybody was happy. QA was happy, IT was happy, devs were happy. Um, it's really I, I really truly believe that if you don't have an external deadline, it's much more important to get it right within reason, right? Um, with this particular thing, it was pretty important. So I don't know how well you guys can see that. Um, but some of the things that are on this checklist, uh, it tells you what we're going to do and who's going to do it, when they're going to do it, and sort of any, the amount of downtime expected. So the stuff at the top is all kind of pre-migration. Um, when you get down further down, you see like that, the things that we're doing actually on the day. Um, so resync the database post smoke test, because when we were load testing, we put a lot of garbage in the data stores, so we had to delete it all and start again. Um, we had to remember to do things like turn everything on in the new system and turn off on-call pages. Um, it sounds like a really silly thing, but given that we knew that most of our stuff was going to be broken for six to eight hours, we didn't need to be waking people up on the other side of the world. In the and it's of the even completely mm -hmm. really simple things, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. you know... Uh, note the time. Yeah. Um, when we wanted to switch over, we needed to note the time in case we had to roll back. We wanted to be able to, like, easily determine which crashes came in before and after the switchover. The other thing you'll see on here is there's a, a rollback checklist. We knew that right up to the moment where we flipped the switch to the other data centre, we could roll back. Without doing anything, we just would not go ahead. Once we had flipped the switch, um, we had this plan for switching back, which was a similar set of steps in reverse. Some bits of it were harder. Uh, old, data centre, old data centre was rel 5.5, new one was rel 6. Uh, old data centre was Postgres 8, new one was Postgres 9. So there were some tricky things like that. Um, we didn't have to do it, which was really pleasing. Um, the other thing, too, is we had a drop-dead point for rollback. We said that after 10 days, it will be too hard um, to go back. So after 10 days, switch off the hardware and do something else with it. We actually turn it into a new staging environment, as it turned out. OK. Oh, did you want to talk about the checklist? OK, that's cool. Oh, yeah, sorry, I thought you wanted to say something. OK. Um, and actually, it went really smoothly, and we were drinking champagne at 11.30 in the morning. Um, they should see. That's Nagios on the screen, and I'm not sure what was red. It couldn't have been anything really important. Yeah, um, <laughs> pro probably went red after we started drinking, I think. Um, yeah, I think that recovered pretty quickly. So. Yeah. Um, and then we, we kind of hung out throughout the day. We did have a couple of little tricky issues. Um, what we had done, because we had switched off processing in San Jose, um, we then had a whole bunch of crashes that we had collected in San Jose that we needed to get to Phoenix. Um, and the previous version of the code that we'd had to like take up old crashes and submit them into HBase um, was single-threaded. And the new version, we had this shiny new multi-threaded version, and we had forgotten that the, um, the crash submissions that had piled up in Phoenix were going through the single-threaded version. It was taking forever. So sometime on the Sunday, we upgraded the code in San Jose and then switched it on, and we got through them really quickly. Um, we also had some network flow issues because the that connection, was, yeah. I think we mm -hmm. had issues with the VPN between yeah. the data centers, so yep. it took a while to stabilize that, and then once yep. that was okay, and yep. they fixed it to be multi-threaded. It was not doing one at a time, so <laughs> it helped. That's it. And on the Sunday, we did all this on a Saturday, on the Sunday, um, one of the external sources of data that we use is a thing called ADUs. Um, it's active daily users of Firefox. So every day that you use Firefox, once a day it pings the block list server to say, are there any plugins that I should be disabling? And we use that to count the number of people that are using Firefox every day. Um, and that data informs all of our graphs. So we, we you know, wake up on Sunday and all of the graphs are broken. Um, and turned out that was a completely unrelated outage because um, that data is stored in a Vertica database run by our metrics group, which had coincidentally decided to catch on fire on Sunday morning. Um, but it was pretty hard to be sure that we hadn't sort of broken anything. So. Okay. 
Um, afterwards, we did a post-mortem. I want to, and I know Selena Deckelman just talked about this. There are all kinds of like nicer, more fuzzy, cuddly names for post-mortems. I call it a post-mortem because um, the other names are all really long. Uh, it's really important to have a post-mortem, even if your project went really well, like I feel like this one did, because um, you know, post-mortems are not about naming and blaming and shaming and throwing things at people. They're really about saying, so what did we do splendidly? And what did we really make a mess of? And what did we learn? What did we do right the third time? And how can we do that right the first time next time? Um, that's really important to like have no finger pointing. You can talk about this all day. But I um, just want to point out this was a successful project and we still had a post-mortem. Um, OK, that's just about everything. I'll take questions. But just in general, um, everything about this project is open source. You can see the data. The only data that you can't get as a member of the general public is the raw dumps and people's email addresses, because the raw dumps contain personally identifying information. And Mozilla is really sensitive about that. Um, but you can see stack traces and see kind of the things that are most commonly wrong with Firefox. If you're running Firefox, you can open up about colon crashes. You'll see a list of your crashes. You can click through to this website and see your crash and the stack trace associated with it, which is really cool. If you want to play with the code or fork it or contribute, it's on GitHub. Um, please feel free. File bugs for us. There's documentation including a new developer guide, and we welcome outside contributions. Uh, there's a mailing list. Join us in IRC. Uh, pound Breakpad for development. Pound IT for sysadmins. Um, and I don't know. And there are jobs to work on this stuff if it's of interest to you. And there's a mailing list for IT as well. It's, oh, I another think one. It's list info slash IT. Okay. Ten minutes. So questions. Sorry? Ten minutes left of your talk. Oh. If you wanted to talk for another ten minutes? I could talk about it for another ten minutes, that's fine. Um, but I'll, I'll see if there are questions at this point. I went really fast, leave time for questions. Mm -hmm. How um, generic is a system? Could it be used for you know, some other applications that are doing crash dumps? Yes, so it is actually used by other people. Um, the Breakpad client, which is the part that actually sends the crashes, is originally written by Google, so I assume it's in Chrome, um, and that's open source. The Socorro crash reporting server, and that catches and processes and reports on stuff, is used by, actually, it's funny. So to use it, you really need something where you um, probably have a client that's running on desktop, right? So it's used by gaming companies. If you, anyone play any games by Valve that use Steam? Steam uses this. Um, they've adopted it. A number of other gaming companies, um, Vigil Games and Gaikai, which is in-game advertising, and a few others. And I know there are people at some other open source projects considering using it, um, which we would welcome as well. I think, um, I'm sure which, which distribution, one of the distributions was looking at packaging it and shipping it as part of the standard distro so you could build it in more easily. Question. It's hard to install, but we're happy to help you. Uh, I was just wondering, um, choosing to install from Tarballs rather than uh, packaging the software yep. seemed an interesting choice. And um, also, um, you were saying that, uh, if I misunderstood you correctly, most of the software is written in Python. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I, I d didn't, uh, understanding how Jenkins or Hudson fits in with this and uh, okay. uh, it also interests me and uh, I'd like to understand better how uh, the role of uh, uh, Hudson, was it involved with testing okay. and stuff? More than happy to answer those. So the first question was why tables and not given that we're on rel RPMs. The initial plan was actually to go ahead and build RPMs. Um, so we had done tables as like an intermediary, like this is really easy to set up step. Um, and then we just kind of didn't see a need to go forward to RPMs. Um, we probably will at some point, but there hasn't been, there's not sort of a, a reason to do it at the moment, if that makes sense. Um, with regards to Jenkins, that came later. So as part of this process of migrating stuff, we set up, it's actually two different Jenkins instances. You can look at our Jenkins tests. I said everything is open. Go to, sorry? If you all look at it, it'll probably crash because it's not like a super highly provisioned box. Um, ci.mozilla.org. Oh yeah, you can put it up there, that might be better. You moved the domain. ci.mozilla.org, dude. You did it, it was your bug. <laughs> how quickly we forget. Um, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about how this works. It's not, oh. I don't know, it's working with it. Yeah. 
yeah, take all the URL stuff off. Okay, so we have two different build jobs. Um, one is Socorro master, one is Socorro release. Our master branch on GitHub is unstable. Um, our stage branch, um, so our release branch is separate and we build them separately. Um, we run a bunch of automated tests on check-in, so you commit something to GitHub, it gets picked up automatically, we run Jenkins, you can see that it got built, and that gets pushed automatically to our dev server. We have three levels of boxes. We have a dev environment, a staging environment, and production environment. When I call it dev, it's not actually a machine you can log into and do coding, it's another staging environment, but it's unstable staging, um, and then staging is supposed to be the same as production. Um, so we have these builds get automatically pushed to dev, the Socorro release job is the release branch, and that gets pushed manually to production. We have all the machinery for continuous deployment, we just choose not to deploy continuously, and I think that's super critical to having a repeatable process. Um, there's actually a second instance of Jenkins, which is internal. Funnily enough, this is all like uh, Python unit tests, pretty much. For the web app, we have a web QA group. They have their own instance of Jenkins with a couple hundred of Selenium tests on it, and those run against the staging web app servers um, and run a whole bunch of other tests, and we need everything green on both before we push. Does that, is there anything else that I didn't cover? Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? We would have to be up right up the back. <laughs> I didn't even see them. One thing I would say while he's running up there, um, in terms of installing it, if you do decide to contribute, it's really hard to install. And one of the things that we've done to encourage contributions is provide VMs with everything already installed and a current checkout. Um, those are done, there's two different ways you can attack that. One is using Vagrant which is a Ruby library for scripting um, VMs. It, it depends on VirtualBox, which is kind of, I don't know how you feel about that, but you can do it that way. Um, and we've also started providing an Amazon image, so you can do it that way too. You asked me a question about Python, which I totally skipped over, I'm sorry. It's mostly Python 2.6, the web app is PHP. And there are some little odd bits of um, PGPL SQL and some tiny bits of Java to run MapReduce jobs. You mentioned going from a single sysadmin legacy environment mm -hmm. to a whole, you know, uh, configuration managed environment. Yep. Did you have any kind of cultural problems with that particular single sysadmin, or is this something that they were all on board with the whole way? I think so. It was kind of a, a bit of a changing in the gut of the guard for a long time. Mozilla's grown really rapidly over the last couple of years. Um, you may have probably noticed that, I don't know. Uh, I've been there for four years and I started, there were 80 people and like three sysadmins. Um, now there are 650 people, 50 some of who are web devs, eight of whom work on this. Um, and how many IT people? Yeah, just to give you a sense of scale, when I joined in 2009, mm. I was the 10th person in yeah. IT. Today yeah. we have 55 people. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's just that I think at that point of time, we didn't have enough free people and we had so much work that yeah. the person who already set it up was just running it. Yeah. And now we've moved, we're slowly moving everything to a system where it's easier for people to, and we're documenting. That's, that's a big step too. We all didn't the stuff, have any documentation. Yeah. yeah so. This is all kind of the standard model for how you do web dev at yeah. Mozilla now, and we so, were one of the first to do that. So, so that makes yeah. it easier. So if a new person comes in, they just look at the documentation, they know where what is, they yeah. have a gist of what the service actually provides, and it's easier to for them to troubleshoot. Yeah. Any other questions? We've got another five minutes. Cool. I'll talk about the virtualization more. Um, one of the things Jenkin does, Jenkins does when it builds is um, it actually builds a new Vagrant VM too. It pulls in as a sub-module from Git and builds it so it's ready to go. Not yet. We tr we've prototyped it. It's cool though. I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Anything else? Well, if there's no other... One more. Mm -hmm. You can ask me anything else Mozilla related if you want but, to, and I'll try. But if you but just coming back to the RPM yep. packages, if you built them as packages, then mm -hmm. it would be easier for people to install them, and uh, then you wouldn't need to uh, just distribute it as uh, uh, virtual machines. But people could could actually install the software because it would. The the thing about the packaging mm -hmm. is that it uh, also yep. helps manage 
configuration and other sure. such things. True, with, with the VM, mm -hmm. that's, that's completely true. But yeah. with the system, I don't know. If, yeah, with the system we currently have, we don't see any benefits as an RPM. Yeah, it would be better for other people, I think. Um, yeah. And if we do end up shipping it as part of the Linux distro, then we probably will do proper packages for it, obviously. But with the VM, yes, I can see your point. Yeah, for it, sure. It makes it easier for us to distribute an RPM that yeah. you can just install. I think yeah. one of the things, too, is um, the Python code isn't hard to install. Um, and that's what's in the table. A lot of what's hard to install, I don't know if you've ever tried to install Hadoop <laughs> on a laptop and HBase, do not recommend. It will take you a while. So it would be like, um, so one of the reasons for doing this VM work is that people would say, I really want to contribute something to the web app. I am a PHP developer and I don't know anything about HBase, but that's fine. Um, and they would spend five days trying to install everything and then say, I didn't really care that much about a one-line patch. Um, and one of the things that we've spent a lot of time on this year is um, making it easier for people to contribute. So that's like a really big deal for us. You know, if you have an itch, you ought to be able to scratch it without having to like jump through flaming hoops, I think. So, yeah. That's it. Okay. okay. Well, on behalf of the uh, organisers of uh, LCA 2012, um, I've only got one speaker's gift, but I can give you a card each. Oh, thank you. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> we can find And uh, it. if we can thank uh, Laura and Charm. Yeah.